Today, I wanted to just share a little bit about my own testimony and my life verse. You know, all through the Bible, we encounter people who've failed, whom God restored. Starts all the way back with Abraham. Well, you can go all the way back to Adam if you'd like, the very first man. Abraham, who took Hagar when God said, wait, I've got a child for you through Sarai. He lied about his wife when he was in Egypt, called, it, called her his sister. David, we know he failed. He committed adultery and had a woman's husband killed. Moses, who murdered a man and hit him in the sand and fled into the wilderness. The apostle Paul, before he came to the Lord, was against Christianity, a murderer. Peter, who obviously denied the Lord three times. And on and on you can go through Scripture of people that God took as failures, people who had blown it, and God restored them and recommissioned them in an amazing way. I think about Peter. You know, I've had the privilege of going to Israel many times, and there's a beautiful little spot on the Sea of Galilee, where they have a statue of Peter and Jesus, and right there on the shoreline, they call it the restoration area, where Peter and Jesus met up, and, you know, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And, of course, at that time, Peter, who had failed miserably, denied three times, he gets recommissioned. He gets put back on the team, so to speak. And on the day of Pentecost, it's Peter who stands up and 3,000 people come to the Lord. Talk about restoring the years the locusts have eaten. Someone once said that God uses failures because there's no other kind of people. We've all failed. There's none righteous, right? No, not one, the Bible says. Now, part of my testimony was I, I was and can still be a shy person. You say, well, how could you do what you do and be shy? Because I'm up here and you're out there. Don't come up here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember going through junior high and high school and, you know, uh, girls would say, boy, that, that guy, he's stuck up. If that, is that a still a term? I don't know if that's a stir, term anymore. He's a stuck-up person. But I really wasn't. I was just shy. I never, I don't think, maybe once, I can't remember, ever asked a girl out. I was too shy. I was afraid I'd get turned down. I mean, even as handsome and debonair as I am, <laughs> I, I worried about that. And my, my childhood was nothing like how my children got to grow up. I had a, a very emotionally and abusive biological father. We rarely went to church. He, he would go at times that just seemed to fit some kind of reason in his mind. I, I, don't, I never knew what it was. When I was 13, my mom divorced my father, and that's about the time I started surfing with my older brother. He was three years older than me and had gotten involved and just loved it and my mom had a rule that he couldn't hitchhike by himself, so he conscripted me to hitchhike with him. And that's how I got into it. My mom had five children. I say my mom because when she divorced, she had a, an eight-year-old and four more up to the age of 16. And she worked two jobs. We lived in Pensacola at that time. I was born in Pensacola, and we we moved from rental house to rental house, I remember. And we didn't stay very long sometimes in homes. We lived all over Pensacola, east and west side. I went to M.B. Cook Elementary School, which was uh, on Cervantes Street. It's a Publix now, right there on the, the main drag of Cervantes. I remember walking into it when it was turned into a Publix. And I thought, wow. And I saw a guy with a tag on it said, manager. And I went up to him and said, you know, I went to elementary school here. He goes, yeah, yeah, everybody tells me that. Well, I went to clubs junior high, which they tore down and then turned into M.B. Cook, which was kind of weird. Went to Pensacola High School until I was 
bust from, uh, we were living on the west side of Pensacola at that time, going to PHS, Pensacola High School, and integration became something that was huge at that time, and I was being bused over to uh, Booker T. Washington, a predominantly black school, and it was just such a crazy time in our culture that being a blonde-haired surfer, it was just, there was fights all the time, it was a difficult time, and so I dropped out of, of, of high school. My mother, my mother somehow allowed me to do that. And th that summer, I went to Rehoboth Beach, Delaware with two of my friends and lived in a surf shop and worked there and sold surfboards. And we actually got on a train uh, here in Pensacola, the three of us, and went all the way to Delaware. This guy picked us up who we were going to work for and surf for. I'll never forget it. He had a cool station wagon. He had a beard. He had, he had long hair. He had a live-in girlfriend. He was probably in his 20s. We were 16, and we thought he was the coolest guy in the world. He, we went to his apartment. He had beads in between all the doorways. You know what I'm talking about? Incense burning, cool music, and we thought we had died and gone to heaven. Wow, this is so cool. We're going to be living in a surf shop, surfing every day. The summer of 17 years old, the next year, my older brother and I, we began to rep for a surf company called Greg Knoll. And because I was out of high school, my mom didn't know what to do with me. She convinced my brother to take me with him. This couple came down from San Diego in a Volkswagen van, and the four of us went down to Miami and from Miami to Maine, we went all the way up the coastline repping for Greg Knoll surfboards, showing Super 8 films of Greg surfing and, and selling boards and taking orders. And it, it was a crazy time in my life at 17 in the 60s and 70s to be in that world, in that situation. I had long hair. It was an interesting time. And it looked like the coolest life, but inside I had a lot of insecurities, a lot of bruises, and a lot of challenges. At 18, I was spending my first summer that I ever spent in San Diego, Pacific Beach, mainly just surfing. Surfed this one spot in the morning by a pier that the waves were glassy, the wind was down. We'd drive up to another place in the midday called Lucadia where they had kelp beds that, that allowed the wind not to bother the surface too much. We'd surf there and then the afternoon back to the pier. That was our, our daily routine other than eating and maybe doing other things we shouldn't do. The December of that year at 18, I had, had come back to, to Pensacola and... Uh, my brother had given his life to Christ, and I remember him coming by, and I think it was an eight-track. He stuck an eight-track in, and he was playing this music. He picked me up, and we were going to go surfing, and it was Christian music, and I asked him, I said, what is that? He goes, oh, that's Christian music. I said, that's terrible. <laughs> he said, no, listen to it. It's pretty cool. I go, no, it's not very cool. He had gotten saved in a Pentecostal church in Virginia Beach on a contest circuit, and he came back to this area, and he gave me a Bible. I started to read it, and I was living in my mother's home, trying to figure out life, and he was going to church all the time. I was curious about it, but I really didn't want to go, and, and, I, and I remember after surfing one afternoon, they, it was a Wednesday afternoon, and they were all coming out of the water early because he had a little group that was going to church with him, and, and I got in his van, I threw my board in, and I said, hey, you going to church tonight? And they all looked back at me and said, yeah. I said, well, why don't you come by and pick me up? They never really invited me, so I had to invite myself. So I went that night, and it wasn't a Baptist church like I had gone to as a kid sporadically. It was, you know, it was different. It was a Pentecostal church. I'd never been in a Pentecostal church before. And the difference between the group that was coming with my brother and the people who were normal church attenders there was vastly different. 
The women had long dresses and buns on their head and people had on coats and ties. And we were like in corduroys and flip-flops and t-shirts. Some of our hair was still wet from surfing. And I thought, wow, this is the most bizarre thing. It's like stepping into a different world. And when the music got going, some of the ladies and men would come out in the aisle. They'd be spinning around. They'd be singing. They're speaking in tongues. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. What have I stepped into? And I'll never forget at the end of the service, I was sitting on the very front row with my brother and a couple of people, and they, they, they gave kind of a call to just come up and pray if you want to pray, and as the music was going, and suddenly I, I had my eyes closed, I'm sitting on the front row, I felt someone sitting next to me, and I looked up, and it was the pastor, big burly guy from Arkansas, and he put his arm around me, and I, I was shy, I didn't really like older men because of my dad and abusive relationship I had with him, he put his arm around me, I kind of stiffened up. And he looked at me and he says, Johnny? And I thought, I'm not Johnny. My name's John. And he said, Johnny? I'm thinking, how does this guy know my name? He goes, do you know the Lord? I go, yeah, I'm pretty sure I do. I've been reading the Bible. And before I knew it, he made some kind of comment like, let's make sure. And he had me on my knees at a pew and was leading me in a prayer, which I later found out was the sinner's prayer. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I prayed the prayer. I started crying. I, I, I felt like something had changed. I didn't know what in the world was going on. And next thing I know, he was gone. He's standing up here at the pulpit. He's saying a few things. And then he says, Johnny's with us tonight. I'm thinking, he's looking at me. <laughs> in the world is he talking about? He goes, Johnny, come on up here and tell people what happened to you. I'm thinking, And I'm, I'm thinking, is he serious? Is he really? So, so he's like, come on up here. So I come up. I, I'm standing behind a pulpit of a Pentecostal church, first church I've been in in I don't know how long. And I have no idea, honest to God, I have no idea what I said. I said something. And I walked down off the platform, and all these people gathered around me, started hugging me saying, we've been praying for you. We've been asking the Lord to save you. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, what is going on? And my life began to change. I, I uh, went to my mom and said, I knew she was so upset about me dropping out of high school. I said, Mom, I, I'll go back to high school. About th by, by this time, she had remarried. In fact, she had remarried, I think, when I was in San Diego, and I remember calling her and saying something like, good for you, Mom. I mean, can you imagine your 18-year-old son? You're getting remarried. You've done everything you can to keep him sane as a, a single mom working two jobs. And he calls you from San Diego and says, I'm so happy for you, Mom. What a jerk. So I wanted to go back to high school to please my mom. So I enrolled in adult high school as a new Christian a lot of older people there, people like me who had been high school dropouts, who, who had been involved in drugs and all kinds of things. And so here I am in that setting. It met at Pensacola Junior College, which is Pensacola State College now. And I saw some of my old friends there. And there was a lot of temptation there. I used to smoke cigarettes. I had quit. There were cigarettes and people offering me marijuana and there were girls and 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 it was a very difficult time and I'd get up every night staying there in my mom's house on Florida Avenue here in Gulf Breeze she had moved over here and I'd go in her little front room kind of like a little living room and and I would wait till everybody was asleep and I'd take my Bible in there and I began to read the New Testament and it would just be amazing to me like wow what Jesus did and people's lives who had been changed. I'd never read the Bible before. And I'd go back to church and Sunday school. I'd ask all these questions. What does this mean? And did this really happen? And it was about that time. I don't remember if it was a family meeting or what was going on, but my mom had remarried, and she married a man who had gone to college, to Florida State, I think, and he had a forestry degree and a good job, and we were sitting around one night, and he made a statement. He said, you know, Pat, my mom's name was Patricia, she was called Pat, she says, you know, Pat, 
I've got three kids and you've got five. He said, none of them seem to want to go to college. He goes, I'll tell you what, if, if one of these kids would go to college, I'd pay for it. Well, I'm thinking because the week before that, at church, this group from Southeastern Bible College had come through, and they had given all these packets to the people who might be interested in going to college, and I had taken one, and the pastor was saying to me, you should go here, you should go here. Well, I had it back in my bedroom underneath a dresser, kind of hidden, and I'm sitting there thinking, wow, he'll pay for it. So being afraid of authoritative men, I went to my mom and I showed her the packet. And I go, look at this. He said he would pay for college? And she looked at it and she goes, John, you need to go talk to Ernie. That's what I called him, Ernie. I was too old to call him dad, so I called him Ernie. John, you need to go talk to Ernie. And I thought, I can't do that, Mom. You have to go with me. Nope. You need to go talk to Ernie and show him this packet and tell him what you want to do. So I remember going into the front room where he was sitting, and I had my little blue packet. And I said, Ernie. He goes, yeah. He was kind of gruff. And I was afraid. I said, I just want to show you this. You mentioned you'd pay for college. And he <laughs> looked at me like, are you out of your mind? You know, you're the most least likely guy in the world to go to college. So I handed him the packet, and I remember him looking at it, looking at me and looking at it, and I'll never forget, he said in the way only Ernie could say, I don't think I meant no Bible college. <laughs> About that time, my mom walked in the room, because I think she was, you know, ha hanging in the hallway listening, and she said, Ernie, you said college, and that's a college. And he's the only one who wants to go. So the timing in my salvation experience and my mom's marriage and, and Ernie's desire to send someone to college kind of all, you know, dovetailed into the fact that pretty soon I was packing up my stuff and heading for four years of Bible college. And it was such an amazing thing because it took me out of this context here where I grew up and had all these surf friends and drug friends and memories, and it took me out of that and put me in a context what well, was completely different than I'd ever been in before. Christians and chapel and Bible study and all these pastors and pastors' sons and daughters. At there I met my wife Lynn my senior year. And it was there that God began to build for me a biblical foundation and lifestyle that I probably would have never been able to accomplish here. And God began to restore the years the locusts had eaten. You know, science declares that we need four basic things to survive, all of us. We need water. We need food. We need air. And we need light. But beyond those external needs that we all have, every one of us also have very deep spiritual relational needs. We're made that way. See, God, our creator, is a relational being. He's a triune being, in fact. He's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And they relate somehow with one another in very distinct, specific ways, but they're still one. And you and I have a mind, we have a body, we have a soul. And beyond these external needs that we have, we have a need to be loved. We have a need to be forgiven. We all carry a certain amount of hurt and pain and guilt. We have, we have a, a need to experience security. And we have a need for an adequate hope for the future. And one of the giant realizations or revelations, if you will, of life is that no other person can meet all those needs for you. Certainly no spouse can. No person can love you as much as you need to be loved. If you try to get that from somebody, you'll smother them, you'll drown them. Inside, you and I have a need for a release from guilt and shame, an adequate experience of forgiveness and love. Security and hope, and, and security doesn't come from money or, or from people or circumstances, and hope 
It's more than someone saying, oh, it's going to work out. Don't worry, be happy. It's more than that. The good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, is not only the truth of God, but it's an invitation. Listen, it's an invitation to a relationship with God, with Him, with His family, the church. It's even an invitation to a new relationship with yourself. My life verse, I want to talk about this verse a little bit. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And this is what happens when you come to Christ. The old begins to pass away. See, the truth about God, it has to start here. Cognitively, you have to hear it. You have to, you, have to, you know, somehow grasp it. But, it. but it has to make its way down here. That's how it works. We get our heads straight about the truth, and then our hearts are impacted by Him, and life begins to change radically. You're a new person. A lot of us, perhaps even you here today, know the truth, but you're not free. Somehow you've you, you got a lot of Bible knowledge, but your heart's all tangled up. Your heart's all still tied up. With all kinds of things. Maybe you grew up in a home with a very inadequate experience of love in your childhood. Maybe you're in a family like that right now. It's difficult and loveless and hard. Maybe you've been impacted by and struggle with feelings of rejection or self-esteem or the pain of broken relationships or you live with a lot of regrets. Memories of different types of failures or things that you've done that you can't forgive yourself for. In the gospel, in the truth of this relationship with Jesus Christ, I believe, listen, I believe you find the love you're looking for. I did. I believe you find the forgiveness that you need, the security that you desire, and, and, and the hope that we all desperately need to move forward in life. Charles Spurgeon, that great teacher, once said, there are some sciences, some truths that can be learned by the head, but the science of Christ crucified can only be learned and experienced by the heart. L listen to our passage in 2 Corinthians. I want to read a couple more verses beyond just verse 17. You know, new creation, old things pass away. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us or brought us to himself through Jesus Christ. And he's given us that same ministry of reconciliation for others. That is, God was in Christ bringing the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he's committed to us the same word of reconciliation. We're ambassadors. For Christ. And this is interesting. He says, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, come to God. That, that, that's what he's done through Christ for us. Come to God through Jesus. And then he says, now you help others. Paul wants us to know this, that God gives us a new life in Christ. He says it in a similar way in Colossians chapter 1. He says, it pleased the Father, speaking of Jesus, that in him all the fullness should dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself, earth, heaven, making peace through the blood of the cross. What's it say? It pleased the Father. Not that it bummed him out, oh, I got to save those people. What a downer, I got to go after these, these failures. It didn't offend God. It says it pleased him because of his great love for you and I. He's not forced to do it. He doesn't do it begrudgingly. It's not like God said, well, I'm God. Who else is going to do it? No, it pleased him. Luke 12, 32, a simple little verse says, Do not fear, little flock. 
For it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, to bring you into a whole new way of living. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God brings us into his kingdom. God gives us this new life. It was and is his heart's desire to give himself for you and to you. It's amazing. The pleasure of God is to love you completely and to change you. God created your heart and mind to be recipients of his love and his grace. And it's a powerful thing when you submit yourself to it. He's for you. He's for your restoration, for the years that were wasted. He's for your strength. He brings joy and love and hope and forgiveness and security. And our deep need for all those things is met and found in the cross of Jesus Christ. God gives you and I a new life fully, permanently, and powerfully. And he brings it through his son. You say, well, but John, I've, I've failed. I can't live this, this Christian life. I, I've blown it big time. We all know what it's like to fail. The things we do, the things we say, the things we think, the Bible calls that sin. And the purpose of God through Christ is to forgive us of our sin, to cleanse us from our sin. Our faults, our mistakes, our rebellion. It's, it's, it's a story that goes all the way back to the garden. <laughs> and we had our seven-year-old granddaughter spend the night she came over Friday around 4 p.m., and she left yesterday around 4.35 o'clock. We spent literally 24 hours with her. If you ever get a chance to spend 24 hours with a 7-year-old little girl, it's amazing. Just her by herself, hanging out with us. We took her to Chick-fil-A for dinner. That's where she wanted to go. I said, why do you like coming over here, Piper? She said, because I ask for stuff and you give it to me. <laughs> well, that's pretty honest. So, so we went to Chick-fil-A. We got her the kid's meal. And, and I don't know if you've bought a kid's meal lately, but in the, this certain kid's meal were these little cards that ask questions to the kid. Like, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite story? And so I'm asking her these questions. And I thought, well, she doesn't know what these questions are. I'm going to make up some of my own. So I said, uh, do you ever hide stuff in your room? And she goes, oh, yeah, tons of stuff. <laughs> and then I thought, well, hmm. Oh, this one says, what kind of stuff do you hide in your room? <laughs> and she goes, I don't know. I can't find it anymore. I thought, wow, she's so honest. You know, we hide stuff. I don't have a little card here today to ask you what you're hiding, but we're all hiding. That, that, that's what we did from the very beginning. When, when Adam sinned, the first thing he did, he ran and he hid and he separated himself from God, and God came looking. That's the wonderful thing about God. He knows we hide. Adam, where are you? You did what? How do you know you did this? And he brings us back. He restores us. You and I are offered the wonderful opportunity, whether we take it or not, to come back to God. If anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things can become new. Isaiah said it this way in chapter 1, verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, and all of us, all of our sins are like scarlet. He says, they shall be white as snow. My, my daughter sent me a little picture yesterday on Instagram of her out in the snow with her two little boys. It's just a beautiful, beautiful white snowy day in Nevada. Reminded me of this verse. And though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Listen to how I want to read how Paul describes this restoration, this forgiveness in the book of Colossians, he, he says it like this. And you 
who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled. He's brought you home. In the body of his flesh through death, Jesus dying on a cross to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Your sins were once like scarlet. Now they're white as snow. The cross, the blood of Jesus. See, all through the Old Testament, even in the garden, there was an animal slain so that Adam and Eve could have skins to hide them, to cover them. And, and from the time of, of the wilderness wanderings to the tabernacle, through the temple, God said there'll be a blood sacrifice to cover and forgive your sins. And it went all the way up to the time of John the Baptist, who was that prophet that had arisen up in Israel after 400 years of silence. And Jesus makes his way out of the Judean wilderness and comes down to the Jordan River. And John points at him and says, look. It's the sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was going to die. He takes our place. He who knew no sin became sin for you and I. It's that amazing verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe or trust in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God loves and demonstrates and gives to you and I his sacrifice, Jesus, on a cross to bring us back. This was and is solid, real, and stable. It's what God's done. He offers salvation. Doesn't go away. Jesus Christ came and impacted the world like no one else has ever impacted the world. It's not a temporary thing. It's not like the bridge, you know, that one day there's going to be a storm and a a barge is going to break loose or a crane and it's going to go away. No, it's going to stay forever and ever. In Christ, there's new life. There's great hope. There's great love. There's great security. There's great forgiveness. Not something I made up. It's not a mixture of, you know, religion and Buddha and feng shui and Eastern mysticism. It's not granola, gluten-free Jesus. It's Jesus of the Bible who lived and died and rose again. Not all roads lead to heaven. Not all roads lead to God. Jesus said this in John chapter 14. Look what he says. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Those aren't my words. Those are Jesus' words. Jesus said, look, if you want to go to heaven, if you want to know the Father, you got to come through me. You say, John, that's so bigoted, that's so narrow. Take it up with Jesus. He said it. He gave his life for it. Peter said it like this in 1 Peter 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He died, he rose again, and in Christ we are loved and forgiven. Let me ask you a question. How's life for you? Are you up or are you down? Are you sad or are you glad? Are you happy? Are you bummed? Are you hostile? Are you angry? Are you lonely? Are you afraid? Are you fearful? Are you grumpy? Are you grouchy? Are you despondent? Are you guilty? Are you hiding? Jesus says, come to me. Have you ever come to him? Do you know for certain that, hey, old things have passed away and all things have become new? What a great certainty to know. You might say, well, I remember praying a prayer way back, but not much changed, John. Or I was baptized as a child or confirmed in a church, but I haven't had what you're talking about where my life changed. Well, I would say he's he's calling you. The Bible says if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. He knocks you open. 
He can and will forgive. That's what he does. And you can come just as you are, old, young, good, bad, slow, fast, ugly, pretty. It doesn't matter. He says, whosoever will may come. You might say, well, I think I'm pretty good. You think? You can know you're good. The Apostle John in his gospel said, these things are written that you can know you have eternal life, not think. You know, if you would have told me when I was 16 years old, living in a surf shop, a high school dropout, that John, one day you'll be a pastor, I would have said, are you on acid? Because that's what I would have thought. That, John, one day you, you'll, you'll have uh, 11 grandkids, you'll pastor a church, you'll be married for 43 years, and, and you'll have this amazing life that God gave you, and you'll travel around the world, and you'll take people to Israel, and you'll teach the Bible. I go, <laughs> well, let me get some of that stuff you got. Where'd you get it? But God does things that you and I could never do. He gives you the years back that the locust restores, and he, he says to you, to me, he says, hey, if anyone, doesn't matter who they are, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things pass away, all things become new. When I went to, to Delaware at 16 with a couple of my buddies, and we lived in a surf shop, we didn't know anything about God. A couple of years later, boom, God had knocked on my heart. I had opened the door. He had so timed things that I was going to be going to Bible college. I look back on my life, and those two guys who I shared with a couple of times, and they, they were from this same area. That they, they were just like me, not much different. One took his own life after being in and out of prison for prescription drug forgery. Another one was an alcoholic most of his life, and I did his memorial service just recently. He never gave his life to Christ. He ended up with dementia. And I, and I step back and go, the only difference I can see is Jesus. And what a difference it is. See, he, he, here's what I want to ask you. Do you know the Lord? Have you come to him? What would keep you from it? 